What if you could take a step back and look at the world? Explore the line between certainty and doubt. You are listening to the Illumination Hour with your host, Ellen Stallone. Again, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Illumination Hour. So, I wanted to spend a minute and apologize for not putting out a show last week. I I felt really bad about it because this has become sort of a tradition for me uh, to record every week, and I really enjoy doing it. So, it it was not an easy choice for me to decide to not put out an episode last week, but. I was feeling very overwhelmed because it's getting close to finals in college, and there's just too much work uh, for one weekend for any one person. And if I had put out a show, I would have been falling behind in school. And for as important as the show is to me, being successful in my academic endeavors is slightly more important. So I just decided that I didn't have the time. And it's not that I don't care about you as a listener, because I do. Um, And I also care about putting a lot of time and effort into the production of these episodes. I don't want to just make something that, you know, I I think is good enough on first try and throw it out there. I want to spend time bringing the quality that you've come to expect from me. Or at least that I've come to expect from myself. And I think that's a fair expectation to have. I think it's good to have an expectation that you are going to do something well and not just do something and then it's over with. You want to make sure that you put in as much effort as you can. So, again, I apologize for not putting out a show last week, but I'm going to make up for it this week because it is Thanksgiving weekend. And although I don't really get into traditional holidays so much, I actually enjoy Thanksgiving because the idea behind it is that you're supposed to be grateful for everything that you have. And although I don't think that being grateful should be restricted to just one day out of the year, I think it should be every day that we are grateful for what we have. But just spending a day and really taking in the gratitude, expressing it to those that you love and the things that you love, that can be really healing. And one of the things that I want to share with you this Thanksgiving weekend is my gratitude for something that I've always loved and I've always wanted to explore more of and learn about. Some of you may already know, but in my college studies, I have a strong preference for chemistry. Uh, Originally, I was going for chemical engineering, and then I switched over to bioengineering, but it's still fairly similar. There's a strong emphasis placed on chemistry, which is the central science. It literally is everything. Everywhere you look, there's chemicals, there's atoms, there's processes occurring, and There's natural phenomena that can be described and explained. And if you understand these things, then you understand essentially how the world works. Of course, it wasn't always so clear as it is today. Even though we don't have all the answers, we are far closer to understanding the nature of our universe today than we were even 100 or 200 years ago. And... As I said in chemistry classes, a lot of the material is presented in a somewhat bland fashion. The facts are presented, this is what this constant means, this is what this law means. But there's no historical aspect presented along with these. You know, how was it that anybody discovered what a molecule versus an atom was? 
How was it that anybody discovered these certain chemicals? There has been a long, drawn-out, meticulous trial and error process over the past millennia, practically, that has built up our knowledge of the world around us, and I want to share with you a small portion of that story today. I want to start by explaining my gratitude for alchemy. Now, we all know that alchemy is a false pseudoscience. You can't actually make gold where there is no gold. But alchemy has played a huge role in the development of the modern world. People's greedy and misguided attempts to create gold out of something that isn't gold have actually led to significant scientific discoveries, as I will be sharing with you. One of my favorite books, I actually picked it up at a used bookstore, not really knowing what it was all about. It's called Crucibles, The Story of Chemistry. The author is Bernard Jaff, and this was written in 1951, but it's still highly relevant today. Even though much has changed since the 50s, the history behind all of these stories is still the same. But I especially appreciate how this book approaches history, not just from a factual perspective, but from a very personal perspective. What were the lives of these chemists or these alchemists like? What did they do? How did they do it? It's all described very well in this book, and I just want to share with you one or two chapters. On the first page of this book, there's a quote that I, I love by Francis P. Venable that says, There is first the groping after causes, and then the struggle to frame laws. There are intellectual revolutions, bitter controversial conflict, and the crash and wreck of fallen philosophies. This describes very well the struggle, the ordeals that people have to go through in order to not only discover, but also disprove and get rid of old ideas that are really just in the way. And sometimes these ideas that are antiquated are very firmly rooted in people's minds, and getting over them is not as easy as it sounds. There is a philosophical war that has to be waged in order to prove something to the scientific community and to the population at large. And all of this arises out of that essential curiosity that discoverers need in order to continue to feed the flame of their willingness to experiment. I said earlier that I am grateful for alchemy, and now I'm going to tell you the story about why I'm grateful for alchemy through a man named Trevisan. He looked for gold in a dunghill, the most unlikely of places. In the dark interior of an old laboratory cluttered with furnaces, crucibles, alembics, stills, and bellows, bends an old man in the act of hardening 2,000 hen's eggs in huge pots of boiling water. Carefully, he removes the shells and gathers them into a great heap. These he heats in a gentle flame until they are white as snow, while his co-laborer separates the whites from the yolks and putrefies them all in the manure of white horses. For eight long years, the strange products are distilled and redistilled for the extraction of a mysterious white liquid and a red oil. With these potent universal solvents, the two alchemists hope to fashion the Philosopher's Stone. At last, the day of final testing comes. Again, the breathtaking suspense. Again, failure! Their stone will not turn a single one of the base metals into the elusive gold. Secretly had the old man worked at first. For had not the Arabian master of alchemy, Geber himself, admonished his disciples, For heaven's sake, do not let the facility of making gold lead you to divulge this proceedings, or to show it to any of those around you, to your wife or your cherished child. 
and still less to any other person. If you do not heed this advice, you will repent when repentance is too late. If you divulge this work, the world will be corrupted, for gold would then be made as easily as glass is made for the bazaars. The quest of the Golden Grail obsessed him. As far back as he could remember, Bernard Trevisan had thought and dreamed of nothing else. Born in 1406 of a distinguished family of Padua, oldest of the northern Italian cities, he had been reared on his grandfather's stories of the great search of the alchemists. Stories of failures, all, but he would succeed where others had failed. Encouraged by his parents, Bernard began his great adventure at the age of 14. His family approved, for they hoped to multiply the young heir's patrimony a thousandfold. But as the years of failure passed and his fortune slowly dwindled, they lost faith, as others had done. They pitied him and attributed his pursuit of alchemy to nothing short of madness. But no failures or discouragement could dampen the hopes of the alchemist. Undeterred by the fiasco of the eggshells experiment, carried on with the aid of Gottfriedus Lurier, a monk of Situ, he continued his labors with superhuman patience. I shall find the seed, he whispered to himself, which will grow into great harvests of gold. For does not a metal grow like a plant? Lead and other metals would be gold if they had time, for twere absurd to think that nature in the earth bred gold perfect in the instant. Something went before. There must be remoter matter. Nature doth first beget the imperfect, then proceed she to the perfect. Besides, who doth not see in daily practice art can beget bees, hornets, beetles, wasps, out of the carcasses and dung of creatures. And these are living creatures, far more perfect and excellent than metals. As you can see, Trevisan believed in the idea of spontaneous generation, which is also something that has been proven to be completely untrue. But back in the 1400s, it was very common to have this belief. For ten more long years... Bernard Trevisan followed the Will o' the Wisp teachings of Razes and Geber. He dissolved and crystallized all kinds of minerals and natural salts. Once, twice, a dozen times, even a hundred. He dissolved, coagulated, and calcined alum, caperas, and every conceivable animal and vegetable matter. Herbs, flowers, dung, flesh, excrement. All were treated with the same painstaking care. In Alembics and Pelicans, by decoction, reverberation, ascension, descension, fusion, ignition, alimentation, rectification, evaporation, conjugation, elevation, sublimation, and endless other strange operations, he tried everything his tireless ingenuity could conjure. Gold is the most perfect of all metals, he murmured. In gold, God has completed his work with the stones and rocks of the earth. And since man is nature's noblest creature, out of man must come the secret of gold. Therefore, he worked with the blood and the urine of man. These operations consumed twelve years and six thousand crowns. He was surrounded by a motley group of pretenders seeking after the stone, by men who, knowing the Italian rich, offered him secrets which they neither understood nor possessed. His wealth dwindled slowly as he supported all manner of adepts, for he had not yet learned that where one honest adept of alchemy is found, ten thousand cheats abound. Finally, he became tired of the knaves who had reduced him almost to penury, he rid himself of these impostors, and turned his attention to the obscure and mystic works of two other masters of alchemy, Johannes de Rupikisa and Sacro Bosco. His faith in the philosopher's stone revived. This time he allied himself with a monk of the order of St. Francis. 
This friar had told him how Pope John twenty second, during the Babylonian captivity, maintained a famous laboratory at Avignon, where he himself labored to make gold. And as he piled up a fortune of eighteen million florins, issued bulls against the competition of other alchemists. Thrice ten times Bernard Trevisan rectified spirits of wine, till, as he said, I could not find glasses strong enough to hold it. This liquor would not fail him, he thought. Again the test was made. The stone proved as unfruitful as ever. But the fire still burned hot within him. He buried himself in the dark dungeon of a laboratory, sweating and starving for fifteen more years in the search for the unattainable. By now he had spent ten thousand crowns, and his health was very poor. But the fervor of the aging man was unabated. Almost maddened by failure, he betook himself to prayer, hoping that God in his goodness would select him as the deliverer of man from poverty. But the favor of the Lord was not visited upon him, and his friend, the Franciscan, died in the quest. Bernard Trevisan was alone once more. He transported his laboratory to the shores of the Baltic Sea, where he joined forces with a magistrate of the city of Trevis, who also belonged to a band of erring men impelled by an almost insane force to the strange search. I am convinced, said this magistrate, that the secret of the philosopher's stone lies in the salt of the sea. Let us rectify it day and night until it is as clear as crystal. This is the dark secret of the stone. So for more than a year they labored, but the opus magus still remained concealed. Now Bernard, still fumbling in the dark, came upon another clue. Turning to silver and mercury, he discovered them in aqua fortis, a very strong acid. By concentrating the solutions over hot ashes obtained from foreign coals, he reduced their volumes to half. Then, carefully, he combined the two liquids, making sure not to lose a single drop, and poured the mixture into a clay crucible, which he placed in the open, exposed to the action of the sun's rays. For does not the sun acting upon and within the earth form the metals, he argued? Is not gold merely its beams condensed to a yellow solid? Do not metals grow like vegetables? Have not diamonds been known to grow again in the same place where years before they had been mined? He, too, had heard of mines being closed to give the metals an opportunity to grow larger. For another five years, he worked with this sun-exposed mixture, filling vial after vial, and waiting for the great change, which never came. Bernard Trevisan was now close to fifty years old, but the fire still burned within him with a full flame. Gathering his meager possessions, he set out in search of the true alchemist. His wanderings carried him to Germany, Spain, and France, where he sought out the famous gold searchers, and conferred with them in the hopes of finding the key that would put an end to his all-consuming desire. He finally settled down in France, still working in his laboratory, when word reached him that Master Henry, confessor to Emperor Frederick III, had finally discovered the secret formula of the stone. He started off to Vienna at once, and found a man after his own heart. Master Henry had been working all his life to solve the supreme riddle of transmutation. He was no deceiver, but a man of God, sincerely searching for the germ of gold. The two dreamers vowed eternal friendship, and that night Bernard the Good gave a banquet in honor of his new partnership to which he invited all the alchemists of the vicinity. At the banquet table, it was agreed that 42 gold marks should be collected from the guests. Master Henry, contributing five marks, 
promised to multiply the coins fivefold in the crucible. Bernard added twenty marks, while his five last surviving comrades, who had kept him company on his travels, added their little share, borrowed from their patron. In a glass vial of strange design, Henry mixed yellow sulfur with a few drops of mercury. Holding the vial high over a fire, slowly he added a few grains of silver and some pure oil of olives. Before finally sealing the glass container with hot ashes and clay, he placed in it the forty-two gold marks and a minute quantity of molten lead. This strange mixture was placed in a crucible and buried in a red-hot fire. And while the alchemists ate and drank heartily, and chattered volubly of the great search of the centuries, the concoction in the vial boiled and bubbled unguarded in the kitchen furnace. Patiently they waited until the vial was broken. The experiment was a failure. Master Henry could not understand. Perhaps, he ventured, some ingredient had been wanting. Others suggested that the phase of the moon or the position of the planets and stars were not propitious for such a momentous experiment. Yet, was it not strange that when the crucible was emptied in the presence of the queer company that surrounded Bernard, only sixteen of the forty-two gold marks were salvaged? The other twenty-six had disappeared, perhaps to appease Hermes Trismegistus, the father of alchemy. This farce infuriated Trevisan, and he vowed to abandon the quest of the Philosopher's Stone. For two weary months, which seemed to go on and on forever, Bernard kept his pledge. But again, that burning in his heart overcame cold reason, and his mind was set once more on retrieving his vanishing fortune through the stone. And now, his thoughts turned to the cradle of alchemy, to Egypt, Palestine, Persia, Greece, Turkey, the Isle of Cyprus. For was not the father of alchemy identified with the grandson of Noah, who was intimately familiar with the philosopher's stone? Had not Sarah, the wife of Abraham, hidden an emerald template engraved with the cryptic directions for making gold? Had not Alexander the Great discovered it in a cave near Hebron? Whatever is below is like that which is above, and that which is above is like that which is below, to accomplish the miracle of one thing. This had he read, and stranger things too. The father thereof is the sun, and the mother thereof is the moon. The wind carries it in its belly, and the nurse thereof is the earth. This thing has more fortitude than fortitude itself, because it will overcome every subtle thing and penetrate every solid thing. By it, this world was formed. Here was the meaningful secret of the universal solvent which Hermes, the son of Osiris, king of Egypt, had discovered. Had not Jason and the Argonauts gone in search of the Golden Fleece? which was nothing else than a book of alchemy made of sheepskin. And had not Gaius Diocletian, Roman emperor in 290 AD, ordered all books which treated of the admirable art of making gold, committed to the flames, apprehensive lest the opulence of the Egyptians should inspire them with confidence against the empire? Perhaps, thought Bernard, some of these books had escaped destruction. There, in the Greek colony of Alexandria, he would rummage through the scrolls of the ancients. For four more years, he made his pilgrimage. In this affair, he wrote, I spent upwards of 11,000 crowns, and in fact I was reduced to such poverty that I had but little money left and yet I was more than sixty-two years of age. Soon he met another monk, who showed him a recipe for whitening pearls. The pearls were etched in the urine of an uncorrupted youth, coated with alum, 
and left to dry on what remained of the corrosive. Then they were heated in a mixture of mercury and fresh bitch's milk. Bernard watched the process, and behold, the whitest pearls he had ever seen. He was now ready to listen to this skilled adept. Upon security of the last remnant of his once great estate, he persuaded a merchant to lend him eight thousand florins. For three years he worked with this friar, treating a rare iron ore with vinegar in the hopes of extracting the mystic fluid. He lived day and night in his dirty laboratory, losing his fortune to multiply it. So obsessed was he by this search that he had no time even to wash his hands or his beard. Finally, unable to eat or drink, he became so haggard and thin that he thought he had been poisoned by some of the deadly fumes in which he had been working. Failure again sapped his health, and the last of his estate was gone. So, alone, friendless, penniless, weary in mind and physically broken, Bernard Trevisan started for his home in Padua, only to find that his family would have nothing to do with him. Still, he would not give up the search. Retiring to the Isle of Rhodes, he continued his work with yet another monk who professed to have a clue to the search. The Philosopher's Stone remained as elusive as ever. Bernard had spent threescore years grappling with nature. He had lost thousands of crowns. He no longer had the strength even to stand before the furnace. Yet he continued the search. Once more he retired to the study of the old philosophers. Perhaps he had missed some process in the writings of the ancient alchemists. For ten long years he read and reread every manuscript he could find, until one day he fell asleep and dreamed of a king and a magic fountain. He watched the heavenly bodies robe and disrobe. He could not understand, and in his dream he asked a priest, What is all this? The priest answered, God made one and ten, one hundred and one thousand, and two hundred thousand, and then multiplied the whole by ten. But still I do not understand, cried Bernard. I will tell you no more, replied the priest, for I am tired. Then Bernard awoke suddenly. He felt faint and knew the end was near. I did not think to die till I had finished what I had to do. I thought to pierce the eternal secret through, with this my mortal eye. Grant me another year, God of my spirit, but a day to win, something to satisfy this thirst within. I would know something here. Break for me but one seal that is unbroken. Speak for me but one word that is unspoken. But the prayer of the dying alchemist was not answered. The fire beneath the crucible was out. The vessels of his mystic art lay round, useless and cold as the ambitious hand that fashioned them and the small rod. Familiar to his touch for threescore years, lay on the Olympic's rim, as if it still might vex the elements at its master's will. And thus, in 1490, died Bernard Trevisan. As we peer down the vista of the past, we find the delusion of transmutation holding the most prominent place in the minds of thinking men. Frenzied alchemy held the world in its grip for 17 centuries and more of recorded history. This pseudoscience with its alluring goal and fascinating mysticism dominated the thoughts and actions of thousands. In the records of intellectual aberrations, it holds a unique position. Even Roger Bacon of Oxford, easily the most learned man of his age, the monk who 700 years ago foresaw such modern scientific inventions as the steamship and the flying machine, 
believed in the possibility of solving this all-consuming problem. Sir Isaac Newton, one of the clearest scientific thinkers of all time, bought and consulted books on alchemy as late as the 18th century. In his room at Trinity College, Cambridge, he built a little laboratory where he tried various experiments on transmutation. After leaving the university, he was still concerned with this problem and wrote to Francis Aston, a friend who is planning a trip through Europe to observe the products of nature in several places, especially in mines. And if you meet with any transmutation, those will be worth your noting. As for particulars, these that follow are all that I can now think of. In Schmenetrium, Hungary, they change iron into copper by dissolving the iron in vitriolate water. He was intensely interested in a secret recipe with which a company in London was ready to multiply gold. Robert Boyle, president of the Royal Society, was also so impressed that he helped to procure the repeal of the Act of Parliament against multipliers of gold. The power and influence of many of the alchemists can hardly be exaggerated. In nearly every court of Europe were men appointed by kings and emperors to transmute base metals like lead and iron into gold, and so advance the financial status of their kingdoms. Records exist which tell of the lending of alchemists by one court to another, and of treatises between states where monarchs traded in alchemists. Many were raised to the nobility many worked shoulder to shoulder with their sovereigns. A number of little houses used as laboratories, situated near the beautiful castle of Emperor Rudolf II in Prague, bear testimony to the monarch's intense interest in this strange science. He neglected the affairs of state to dabble in science, and in Vienna are still displayed leaden bars which Rudolf tried to convert into gold. Two years before Bernard Trevisan was born, England, by act of Parliament, forbade the making of gold and silver by alchemical process. Later, however, King Henry IV granted the right to make gold to certain persons, and at the same time appointed a committee of ten learned men to investigate the possibilities of transmutation. Henry VI went further. He encouraged both the nobility and the clergy to study the science of alchemy, in the hope that they might help him pay the debts of the state. Two soldiers, Edmund de Treford and Thomas Ashton, organized a company which was granted the privilege in 1445 to make the yellow metal and actually produced a product from which coins were minted. When the Scots heard of their English gold, their parliament refused to allow it to enter their country. Upon analysis, they found it to be an alloy of mercury, copper, and gold. While among the alchemists there were some genuine enthusiasts like Bernard Trevisan, the annals of this queer practice are filled with accounts of charlatans and spurious adepts, who, with a deluge of glib words, but with only a drop of truth, turned alchemy into one of the greatest popular frauds in history. The writings of these avaricious devils and honest fools are a meaningless jargon of cryptic terms and strange symbols. Their public demonstrations of transmutation were often clever enough to fool even the most cautious. Many came to witness the making of gold from lead and iron, convinced that it could be done. For had they not seen iron vessels plunged into certain natural springs containing copper salts emerge covered with the red metal? It was a matter of common knowledge that a dark, dirty ore could be heated until all its impurities were destroyed and a bright, shiny metal was obtained. Traces of silver and gold had been found in many ores, then why could not the further heating of these ores yield larger quantities of the precious metal? In fact, with sufficient treatment, it ought to be possible to change the ore entirely into lustrous gold. 
simple enough questions in the light of their ignorance of chemical facts. Besides, nature was performing marvelous transmutations every minute of the day, as food was changed into blood and sugar into alcohol. And there were mystics who saw in the change of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ as the consecration of the elements in the Eucharist a hope that, by the help of God, a similar transmutation could be effected of the baser metals into gold. In many of the museums of Europe, we can still see shiny yellow metals reputed to be gold products of the deceptions and trickery of the gold cooks of the European courts. The Hessian thalers of 1717 were struck from alchemical gold and silver. Some of these samples came from the false bottom of a crucible whose true bottom had been publicly filled with a mysterious mixture which furnace heat was turned into gold. Other nuggets of gold were gathered from the inside of hollow nails which had been used by impostors to produce gold by transmutation. The penalty for failure to produce the Philosopher's Stone was heavy. For Bernard Trevisan, it meant the loss of an immense fortune, the discouragement of seventy and more years of futile, tireless labor, until death finally came. For many others, it was premature death. History records the exposure and punishment of more than one imposter. Marco Bragadino, the gold maker, was hanged by the elector of Bavaria. William de Cronemann met the same fate by the hands of the Margrave of Beirut. David Benther cheated the elector Augustus of Saxony by killing himself. And in 1575, Marie Ziegleren, a female alchemist, was burned at the stake by Duke Julius of Brunswick. Frederick of Würzburg maintained a special gallows, ironically painted in gold, used solely for those unfortunate alchemists who could not fulfill their promises to make real gold. On the gibbet, an inscription had been posted by the hangman for the entertainment of its victim. I once knew how to fix mercury, and now I am fixed myself. During the summer of 1867, three clever rogues met in Paris. Ramualdo Racatani, a Roman archpriest. Don José Moroto Conde de Fresno y Londres, a Spanish grandee and Colonel Don Antonio Jimenez de la Rosa, a Neapolitan chevalier. The possessors of these sonorous names had a secret process for turning silver into gold. They were shrewd enough to realize that Emperor Francis Joseph of Austria was, by dynastic tradition at least, keenly interested in alchemy. Arriving in Vienna, they cleverly obtained an audience with the monarch and offered him the most momentous discovery of all time. In Mariposa, California, they told his majesty, were natural deposits of white nuggets which contained gold formed from silver by the action of mercury in the heat of the sun. They continued, This same process of transmutation may be brought about much more quickly by artificial methods, through giving the amalgam a specific gravity of 15.47. Thereby, a process of nature is imitated with the silver amalgam is exposed to a greatly increased temperature. Francis Joseph made an initial payment of $10,000 for the secret, and assigned Professor Schroeter, discoverer of red phosphorus, to supervise a small-scale experiment in the laboratory of the Polytechnic. On October 17, 1867, two iron pots and two glass retorts were filled with silver amalgam and heated for four months. The vessels then cracked. No gold was found. Then, opportunely, the adventurers disappeared, thus cheating the gibbet of three distinguished victims. About one hundred years ago in enlightened America, an alchemical enterprise was started by Dr. Stephen H. Emmons. 
this english poet novelist logician chemist and metallurgist claimed to have discovered argentarium a modern philosopher's stone which could augment the amount of gold in an alloy of gold and silver many fanciful stories about this undertaking appeared in the press even though dr emmons tried earnestly to surround his experiments with strictest secrecy much of what appeared in print was deceptive but this we know the syndicate formed by the english adventurer sold to the united states assay office six ingots of an alloy weighing ten pounds which upon analysis showed the presence of gold and silver the government paid him the sum of nine hundred fifty four dollars for the metals and dr emmons straight away advanced this payment as proof of his astonishing success for a moment the affair seemed to promise a recrudescence of alchemy the first dividends were paid and emmons even promised a public demonstration at the world's fair in nineteen hundred which however never materialized the whole scheme was a fraud, and before long the name of Dr. Emmons was added to that long list of men and women who have gone down in the limbo of the past among the spectacular failures of history. Alchemy, nourished in superstition and chicanery, still has its adepts and believers. In France, there exists an alchemical society for the study of alchemical processes of transmutation. August Strudenberg, one of Sweden's great modern literary figures, was a firm believer in transmutation. People ask me if I can make gold, he wrote, and I reply, to draw the genealogical chart of the ancestors of a cat, I do not need to know how to make a cat. He knew, at least he believed, the secrets of the great riddle, but he never professed to make gold. In Germany, Franz Tausend, a former plumber, was arrested in 1929 on a charge of having swindled a number of prominent financiers, including General von Ludendorff, of more than $100,000 through asserting that he could make gold synthetically from lead. From his cell and jail in Munich, Tausend insisted his discovery was based on modern scientific principles and demanded a chance to show his methods. He was finally taken to the state mint, and in the presence of its director, two detectives, the state's attorney, and the examining judge, he began his experiments. Every precaution was taken to prevent fraud. He was minutely searched. All apparatus and chemicals were supplied for him, from a carefully guarded safe. The judges watched vigilantly while Towson worked cleverly with his tincture of tinctures, made up of lead chloride and calcium hydroxide smelted with mercury, potassium, and sodium. In his second method, he used potassium hydroxide, rock flint, and ferric oxide. Then came the official announcement. After experimenting for two hours, Towson produced a crane of the purest gold weighing one-tenth of a gram, which was smelted from 1.67 grams of lead. Experts described the results as surprisingly favorable and contradictory to scientific knowledge. The cost of production of this alleged synthetic gold was estimated at $5 per kilogram, as against 700 in the present world market of 1950. The world might have accepted this man and his methods, but the following day, the director of the Mint discovered that, in spite of all the precautions they had taken, gold which came from the ashes of a cigarette had been smuggled in to Towsend and had accounted for the remarkable result. Towson was sent back to his prison cell, challenging the world to try his process. No doubt the credulous did, for the spell of frenzied alchemy still persists. 
What was the significance and value of this strange search for the philosopher's stone? Was it just a meaningless, childish reaching for the moon? Was alchemy really chemistry, as Liebig, one of the world's greatest chemists, believed? Was this long tragedy and farce of alchemy all in vain? Well, surely it was not in vain. Francis Bacon compared alchemy to the man who told his sons he had left them gold buried somewhere in his vineyard, where they, by digging, found no gold, but by turning up the mold around the roots of the vines, procured a plentiful vintage. In this fanatical search, a great mass of valuable discoveries was made, and many chemical facts were learned. Nitric, hydrochloric, and sulfuric acids, the three most important acids employed by the modern chemist, and aqua regia, the powerful solvent for gold formed by mixing the first two of these acids, were introduced by these early gold searchers. In their quest for the seed of gold in the dirt and dross of centuries, new elements like antimony, arsenic, bismuth, and phosphorus were unearthed. Many of the common chemicals of today owe their discovery to those early days. Alum, borax, cream of tartar, ether, fulminating gold, plaster of Paris, red lead, iron and silver salts, and heavy barium sulfide, the first substance known to glow in the dark after exposure to sunlight, stumbled upon by Cascariolo, a cobbler of Bologna. Some of the apparatus and utensils which are the tools of the chemists of our scientific laboratories were first introduced by alchemists. Coupel, distilling flask, retort, water bath, and even the balance in its crude form. The extraction of gold by amalgamation with mercury, the preparation of caustic alkali from the ashes of plants, and other new processes of manipulation and methods of manufacture were developed by the gold cooks and their manifold operations. This heritage is indeed a rich one, for in their blind groping for a new process to make gold, these adepts of alchemy paved the way for the more fruitful science of chemistry. Synthetic gold, however, never came. As Bernard Trevisan lay dying on the Isle of Rhodes 400 years ago, he uttered with his last breath his conviction. To make gold, one must start with gold. And that, my dear friends, is the story of alchemy that I wanted to share with you. We all sometimes take it for granted that we just know of chemical compounds. We know what reacts with what and how certain molecules are formed. Hundreds of years ago, it may have been believable to think that gold could be made from other metals. Looking back today, these ideas of spontaneous generation or of gold growing as it's hid by sunlight, they seem foolish, completely misguided. But it was people like Bernard Trevisan who had that fire burning within them, that willpower that could never be extinguished, the continuous search for answers, reaching for the moon, child's play even. All of these things, together they led to greater discoveries. I can't even imagine devoting my entire life to a study of something that I believe to be a science. and finding out in the end that it's false. But if you look at it from a different perspective, this chasing of this false science led to the innumerable discoveries of chemistry, the real central science that we now know. So this Thanksgiving week, I am grateful that alchemy existed. Not because I believe that the Philosopher's Stone is real, 
or that gold can be produced by anything other than gold itself, unless we want to talk about nuclear fusion, which is by all accounts much more advanced than anything that the alchemists were attempting to accomplish. But I am grateful for this suit of science, the fact that it existed and that there were people who practiced it with a fervor like Bernard. Because in the grand scheme of things, it led to a brilliant world being unveiled to humankind. It started to pave the way for the understanding and discovery of what is real in this world what we can really count on to be factual. It was through the process of alchemy that people learned how to conduct scientific experiments. They refined the scientific method. They took astute observations. And through this long, drawn-out, painful process, something even more beautiful arose from it. So I am grateful to people who devoted their lives to studying what they believed in, even if it turned out to not be true, because they believed in themselves most of all. They devoted their lives to what they loved, and in doing so, they provided the world with something to look at and admire, and for that, I will always be grateful. Especially since now chemistry is so much easier for me, and for everyone else who practices it. But I think the most important takeaway is that science itself is a crucible, where the misteachings and bits of truth are all thrown into this crucible. And through tedious trial and error, through the heat of intense scrutiny, the lies and deceit are burned away, and only the beautiful truth remains. I hope you all have had a wonderful, joyous Thanksgiving, and you've taken the time to be appreciative of not only people in your lives, but things that you are grateful exist, things that make your existence more fulfilling and be grateful for them not just one day a year, but every day. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Illumination Hour. If you have any comments or questions, please email me at illuminationhour at gmail.com. It's been great, and I will see you all again next week. <laughs>